Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit on uh, what we're seeing in wood flooring uh, specifically. And a lot of it's similar to what we're seeing uh, Alessandra shared with us on furniture. I won't be able to share it with you quite as beautifully. My accent's not quite as, quite as nice to listen to. But uh, We'll start and I'll tell you just a few things about NWFA. We have uh, 3,400 member companies worldwide. About 10% of those are actually here in Canada. Um, we represent the entire supply chain, so we have manufacturers, distributors, contractors, retailers, um, inspectors, and installers all participating in the association, um, and we're headquartered in St. Louis. One of the main things that we do is we provide training for contractors. Um, we do, we've been doing hands-on training for um, more than 30 years, and uh, we recently took that from a, to a regionalized uh, structure instead of having it all centralized in St. Louis. So we do about 50 weeks of training around the country. Um, we actually recently just hired someone out of Vancouver to help us grow our presence in Canada. So hopefully um, he'll be here m with you next year and you'll get to know him. Um, we also launched an, our online university last July. And so now we have an integrated education platform allowing you to learn uh, both online and hands-on. We test um, on the front end and on the back end, so if you're certified through us, we know that you've learned the information because it's been, it's been tested through in bits as, go, as people go through the courses. Um, that's just a little bit more about NWFA University. We've had, since July, almost 8,000 courses completed, so about every 32 minutes, somebody completes a module, which we're really proud of. We did, weren't sure how the market would, would adapt. And there are some training in there, and we're advancing some of our training back to um, more of a resource standpoint, so where does wood come from, those types of things. So there may be some training in there that would be applicable across uh, more than just the wood flooring sector. We also have CEUs that are designed to take out to architects and designers uh, for continuing education credits. In order to present those, uh, you have to be certified with us, and then you can certify the lunch and learns. But we also now have 14 of those uh, housed inside our online university, so those are available to the a and community to help us promote the use of hardwoods. We also do standards and guidelines um, for the installation process, sand and finish. Um, those are our four main technical publications, which one of those gets revised every year, so we're keeping things current in the market. Um, we also have NAFMA inspections, which are it's a quality control program. Um, it's been around for about 100 years. Uh, it was originally on unfinished product and um, solids. Um, we now have a factory finished certification that goes with NAFMA as well. And then we actually have our own chain of custody program called our NWFA Responsible Procurement Program, which is a stepwise approach to FSC. And we're going to go through a little data here and kind of see where the marketplace is at. Um, when you look at this picture, what you're really seeing is the picture of the recession. So you can see the downturn and then the upturn coming back. And this last line here, um, that's that's very uh, aggressive, I think, for 2019, but those are the numbers that we're seeing coming out of some of our forecasters. But you can clearly see that, um, the, you know, the good news here is that we're, we're way past the recessionary numbers. We're back over where we were at the height of the market um, in the U.S. Conversely, in Canada, uh, there was not a dip like there was in the, US, in the U.S. market. So the dip was not nearly as strong here as you can see going from 2007 back up to 2013. Um, you know, it stayed pretty even right around a billion. So Canada uh, has done really well in, in struggling through some of those tougher times that the U.S. saw. We're looking now at this chart. This shows us exports and imports um, in the U.S. You can see that exports have maintained relatively been uh, flat across that time period, yet imports have increased dramatically. Uh, most of those imports are coming from uh, China. In the Canadian market, um, you can see that the exports going out uh, dropped pretty dramatically from 2007 to 2010, and they've stayed right around that, around that line. But at the same time, imports have also dropped significantly. When we look at the difference between the usage of, or the sales of solid versus engineered in the Canadian market, um, engineered has, has um, outperformed solid for several years now, so at least for the last decade, there's been more engineered uh, product come being <clears throat> created in Canada. And in the U.S. market, you can see that it was a much more of a dramatic shift um, going from a primarily solid market now to about even 50-50 split between solid and engineered in the States. 
As far as consumption, when we look at where is wood flooring going, um, more than half is going to the Far East. So um, even though it's, it's a large marketplace here in North America, uh, combined, we're not even really reaching half of, of what's going to China. When we look at the sales uh, by type, you can see here this, this breaks the, the other data down a little bit differently. You can see over the last, uh, well, during this four-year period that was actually just published in 16, uh, but we only have the updated information from 14 on, on those studies. They're at least two years behind whenever they're published. But um, you can see that engineered has grown significantly uh, by product type over that four-year period. And um, the others have stayed you know, relatively steady, and parquet is obviously a very small part of the market. By board width, um, we, we kind of define plank as three inches and above, and strip as three inches and below. And the, uh, it's about half, you know, it's about even half and half, but plank continues to grow. So if you looked at the last four years, you would see continuing growth on the three inch and above side, not and strip going down a little bit. When we look at how wood floors are going down today, um, you can see a significant shift here from going from a nail down process, uh, floating picking up a lot of that percentage as we see more and more floors that, um, that uh, glide along the top of the, of the subfloor. Some trends that we're seeing that affect, obviously, uh, wood flooring and the whole wood flooring market, especially here in North America, um, there's all, these are all really good indicators. There's nothing that's come up that's really saying, you know, the market's going to not hold its own uh, and be, have significant growth for the next several years. But housing starts with the highest since 2007. Builder confidence is the highest it's been in 12 years. New home spending is up. Existing home sales are up. Um, so there's really nothing in, because when, when we look at the market predictors for wood flooring specifically, we really look at housing starts and we look at those housing numbers because they all predict that's the number one indicator for us of how our market's going to perform. The biggest thing that we're, we're faced challenge-wise in the marketplace right now are look-alike products. And Alessandra talked a little bit about this too, about products that are being made that look like wood. And unfortunately, uh, to some degree, the, um, the photography has gotten so good now on the, on the ability to put a, a, a picture of wood onto tile or onto laminate or LVT that it really, is, um, it really is creating a trend. I was on the plane coming up looking at uh, one of the flooring magazines and it was all a story about LVT. But as you flip through the pages, every picture was wood. And so in a magazine format, you can't really tell the difference. And Quite frankly, um, a, lot of, a lot of people can't tell the difference. The photography has gotten so good that, um, especially if you're in a restaurant or a bar and you look down at the floor and you're trying to figure it out, even if you get down and look at it closely, you can't always tell. It used to be the repetitive pattern wasn't there, that the photography wasn't advanced enough that you couldn't tell the difference between real and, uh, and fake wood. But the photography's gotten so strong now and the pattern repetitiveness uh, is, not, is not as prominent. You know, you can see that pattern repetitiveness in this photo, for example, but over here, you really can't tell. That's, and that's a tile over here. And the, the tile quality has really, really gotten very, very good. Now, that's not necessarily all bad news because those, a lot of those products are being sold to people who wouldn't have bought wood in the first place, perhaps. They're going into multifamily or they're going into structures that want the look of wood but couldn't have afforded to buy the real thing. So in some ways, we, we try to look at it positively and think that it's, um, you know, it's free advertising for these other products to carry wood. But it also advances the look of wood into, into, into hospitals, for example, or into commercial buildings where you wouldn't have normally found a wood used. Um, but it's not bad for us to have that look out there. The only, the only thing we really are quite concerned about is whether the look of wood will go away because it's being oversaturated in the marketplace on everything that the consumer is looking at right now. But I don't, I don't see, you know, when we look at the numbers, we don't see any indication that the number for wood flooring specifically is going to go down. We just see these other categories growing, and they happen to look like wood. Um, you know, last year we also had some, one of the shifts that's happened in the marketplace is obviously a concern um, over, <coughs> concern over health concerns. 60 Minutes came out with an expose type of story on um, a manufacturer who actually was on their laminated product, but um, they kept calling it engineered wood, which it, it wasn't. And so our office fielded probably three or 4,000 phone calls trying to provide clarification to the consumer who was confused about whether they should have their wood floors tested or whether they even had wood or not. 
So when we look at those things, um, that combination of things, the look-alike products and the, the consumer concern that's been out there over the last 18 months or so over formaldehyde-related issues, and these are just some of the news outlets that you've uh, seen those stories on, you know, we feel like as an industry we have to look at ways that we can promote the, the good qualities of wood so that people do have a differentiator. They do know to look to see whether it's a photograph of wood or whether it's real wood. They, and they want to see, we want them to notice where that wood's coming from as well. Um, some of the ways that we communicate to the marketplace, uh, Harvard Floors Magazine is our, is our magazine, which also has weekly news, uh, an online component, so you can keep, keep up to date on what's happening in the wood flooring sector. Um, we also have a consumer-facing piece that goes out through our NWFA retailers. They can co-brand these pieces and hand those out to at the point of sale um, for consumers. And the idea here is that um, the market is so fragmented for wood flooring today compared to what it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago that 15 years ago you had a, you had a dedicated distribution line that really only handled wood. You had dedicated contractors and retailers who were really only selling wood. Today, and, and a lot of this got driven by the economy, um, you know, when, when, the, when the economy tanked, everybody looked for something else to add as a product line. So factory finished wood floors became that solution for a lot of traditional carpet retailers. So we've seen more and more people in the distribution channel and in the retail channel take on, they, you know, they, they didn't ever want to take on the unfinished wood flooring lines because that required having to have someone who knew how to sand and finish, who knew how to do all of the things that go with that process. But in a lot of ways it came in a box and they thought they could sell it. And, but what they failed to understand is that what's in that box is still wood and it still performs the same way as an unfinished wood product does. The, the moisture issues are the same. You can't, you can't just put it wherever you want it without having some education on where and how it should be used. And so we see that as a, we see that as a huge problem within the marketplace. Again, people who are selling the product aren't specifying it in the right place. Sometimes that's at the retail level, sometimes at the, even at the distribution level, if those, if those distributors and retailers were primarily carpet stores uh, before the mid-2000s. So this piece is designed not only to educate the consumer by having the retailer handed out to them, but also to have uh, the, the consumer actually be able to help sell it to themselves. So we provide them with a checklist at the end that makes sure they've asked all the right questions so that we can at least know that they've tried to specify the right, right product um, in the home. Because one of the issues that we see continuously at the retail point of sale is you've got somebody who may have been working in a retail environment for a number of years who's very comfortable selling carpet. Um, the price point for carpet versus wood is significantly different. They're not, as, they're not as good at selling the higher end luxury item because they're not as familiar with wood as they probably should be. So this, this at least allows us a way for the consumer to have that conversation back with the retailer. And we also then aim education at the retailer through our online university because chances are, from a retail standpoint, the people that were selling the product were never going to be sent to training um, across the country. But we can get to them in a university platform and make for sure that they um, know what they need to know to successfully sell wood. And then this is our consumer awareness uh, website, woodfloors.org. Um, one of the things that this, this site does is to really try to help drive the education on you know, what to do with your wood floor if you have a question about it, um, or how to really get it right the first time. We, we try to aim it there. And we also then, if you're an NWFA member, the, um, you can search the website by zip code so you can find a local resource who can come in to take care of your problem. One of the things we've also done is created a badging system so that our contractors have specific ways of being identified and the search uh, goes up on this. So for example, if, you're, if you have earned your badge for board replacement through NWFA and you've taken the courses that are necessary to know how to do board replacement and a consumer is looking for board replacement, you'll get populated higher up the list for having achieved that education. So we are constantly looking for ways that we're advocating the professional in the marketplace and trying to be the consumer's resource uh, for finding the right answers. And that's if really it, unless someone has some questions. Yes? Yes. Um, What's the raw material? Uh, it's where the volatility really comes from. Um, and, you know, coming out of the recession, the, especially, and, and obviously we saw that Canada wasn't as affected as the U.S. was as far as uh, where housing really dropped to. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the mills that had people working, those people went away and they went off to do something else. So there wasn't any labor coming out of the recession to meet the demand. 
And so it's still, that's still a problem because finding trained labor and finding people who are willing to go out and do those jobs is still a challenge. So we'll see even you know, on, uh, on products that are pretty commodity oriented that the demand is just, it's harder to track today than it was 10 years ago. Who takes on most of the price risk? Well, I think that you really see that happening at the manufacturer level on the, you know, the manufacturer that's making the flooring where on the purchasing price because they may not be able to go into the market and sell it higher if their competitor isn't matching the price. Because it's still a very price-driven market, unfortunately, especially at the commodity level. So th there's volatility at both for the manufacturer on his raw material and his output? Yes. Yes, and I think that, you know, the volatility is different and because it is a natural resource. So when you're competing within the, the flooring sector with, say, five major, wood, or major floor covering segments, the volatility in those other segments isn't as high as it is in hardwood. What about on the engineered product? Is it the same? There's a little more control on the engineered side. Um, you know, you're using less of the natural resource on the, on the face plate. So, um, but you're also doing more species traditionally than, than what you would be with a solid you know, red oak or white oak where that was your mainstay strip flooring. Sorry to interrupt, but if you could repeat into the microphone, please. We need it for the video. Thanks. Are you making any headway in terms of uh, leads approval and uh, environmental factors? Uh, do you see a growth point in that area versus other competing products? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the question. In terms of, uh, uh, in terms of flooring, do you see um, more headway being made in um, leads uh, products or leads uh, building uh, environmental uh, areas? Is, there, is that a growth area for that? Uh, um, to some degree. Um, I think that we've partnered with the North, or the, uh, North American Home Builders Association and we're part of their green building standard because their standard tends to be on the residential side, obviously, uh, through home builders, whereas lead tends to be more commercially driven um, than, and the use of wood flooring in the commercial environment is not as prevalent as it is. Um, as on the residential side, about 90% of the marketplace is residential. But yes, we're, there's, we're, con we're continually trying to grow that, you know, that the wood is good message. In the same area of environmental values, do you see any growth or any increased demand for certification uh, product regarding FSCP, FC, or forest certification or green certification in flooring? What we see continually is it's a nice to have, it's not a must have at the consumer level. And so the consumer isn't willing to pay more for it. So that traditionally drives back to the manufacturer that it's an increase in their cost, but they're not gonna see that come back on the, on the, from the marketplace. So no, we don't see, we don't see pin up demand for people trying to, to be more engaged with any, either of the schemes. And in the same area, do you see, uh, or do you work as an association to push the value in terms of carbon sequestration for wood compared to the other floor covering systems? Uh, are you working on this? Do you see some future and regulations yes. and all this? Yes. No, I think you know, the more the more of those pieces of the story that we can tell, the better off we are. And um, you know, it's funny though. Some of the things we end up competing with, um, you know, we have we have a, one carpet manufacturer who was trying to say that. The, uh, the, the carpet that they had was not only sustainable, but it also cleaned the air. And there actually is a wood flooring base here in Canada that, it, that claims to do that, uh, but it's certainly not carpet. So, you know, the, the things that are out in the marketplace, there's a lot of greenwashing that happens. Um, and so what we put out, we want to, you know, we want it to be based in science. Um, the other thing that's a little maybe different um, for the U.S. versus Canada on the, on the schematic is, you know, there's so much there's so much forest land um, that basically just became FSC certified, very, you know, large vast of uh, government-owned government -owned land that could be easily certified um, as FSC, whereas in the States it's primarily small farmers that own, you know, different, pe different parts of the land, so it's hard to certify large pieces at the same time. So most of them rely on things like the Seneca study, which basically shows the states that are renewing 
And I know uh, Mike Snow was here last year from the American Hardwood Export Council, and uh, he presented at the Hardwood Manufacturers Association meeting last week. And one of the things he showed us is a, is a map on their website where you can basically click on where your wood's going to come from, and it'll show you the rates. So there's some really fascinating stuff that's coming out that I think for the U.S. market in particular, the, the, the environmental schematics are not, the, the carrying those labels isn't really providing anybody with anything they're not already able to show. That seems to be the response from, from our folks anyway. What is the status of the environmental product declaration? Are, are your members joining this issue, or is it like in Europe, or are they still avoiding it? Well, we have some manufacturers who have done their own EPDs, and we're looking at some of those to see if there's a way that we can do an industry-wide <coughs> EPD that would really apply uh, as a more of a blanket effect. But those conversations are, are just in development. I wouldn't expect to see anything you know, in the next 18 months on anything like that. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Maybe before you leave there, uh, Michael, just uh, one thing for mm -hmm. some of us here in Canada. We've heard a rumor that you have a new president. Th what the sentiment is amongst your members about the next couple years and uh, the impact on consumer demand? When, when we ask our members what their outlook is, it's, it's been much, much stronger since the election. So I'll leave it at that and not get into the politics of everything, but I think for the most part, when we're conversing with our members, they're saying they expect less regulation, they expect a, a more open uh, ability to go to market. They have, obviously, concerns over trade. Um, there's some craziness, but, I mean, there's always a little craziness somewhere, but and there are some of the things that have, are said are particularly concerning. Um, but I think, the, overall, the general business climate, everyone seems to be going about as fast and as hard as they can. The thing that we think um, we're going to have the most problem with over the next five years, and I'll digress from the question a little bit, is that you know there's just there's not enough skilled labor. So one of the things that we're looking at doing is try to uh, create some skilled paths with some technical schools so that we can start getting more people not only into installation but also into plants. And there's just there's we're all going to be vying for jobs that um, competitively our our industry is not known for paying the highest wages. It's not known for um, advancing, continuing education, and those types of things. So I think we're going to have to change some of those things um, in order to make our make our industry attractive, and uh, again focus on the trade part of it being an important piece of working working with a natural product. We have attributes that uh, the millennials and the next generation will look at and, and find very attractive. Um, again, you're working with a natural product. You're working with something that's sustainable. You're working with something that um, has a, a long life cycle. So. From those perspectives, we have attractive things to offer, but we've got to work on some of the others. 